Okay, Mr. Marshall. Um, it is 6.31. You have a quorum present. You are the co-host. The attendees are coming in. Amherst Media is here. You're good to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of August 3rd, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022. This planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No meeting, no in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Yes, I'm here. Tom Long. Present. Uh, Andrew McDougall, I, I believe, is not here yet. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. Thank you and welcome. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so that's our intro for this evening. And uh, uh, first item on the agenda, the time is 6.36, and we'll go right to uh, review and approval of the minutes from our last meeting which was July 20th. So board members, uh, any comments on the minutes? Johanna. Um, first of all, thanks. The minutes are easy to follow as somebody who wasn't there. I feel like I have a good handle on what was covered. Um, there are two spots where I noticed typos. So on the first page, there's an extra comma in the attendees. Um, and I'm sorry. And then, so, you know, at six, like after Miss, Ms. Winter, there's an extra comma, comma. And then 
um, the word town council is misspelled on pages five and six. Um, but other than that, I think these minutes look really good. And Doug, if we're ready, I'd be happy to move to approve them. Well, I'm going to ask you where the extra comma is, because are you talking about on the first page under present? On, <clears throat> on the first page at 634 PM, the second line opened the meeting and determined ah, okay. call that. Do you see it? No. No, those both of those commas look appropriate to me. The after Ms. Winter? Yeah, wow. well, that's a it's a clause. It's a clause. With the exception. Oh my gosh, of... you're right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That one is rescinded. So then it's just the homonym okay. of council and council on pages five and six. Five and six. Okay. Um, Johanna, where, where do you see the, I, yeah. I, where is it, it, um, hang on, isn't it spelled correctly at the bottom of page five? It is. And then there's another spot where, oh, where is it? Um, on Connie Kruger's comments. Oh, uh, yes. Pound cell. Yep. On cell, and then it's again at the top of page six. And it's also part. on page five after under Miss McGowan's comments. So when no. may no. I say something? Um under Connie Kruger's comment, it should be Count Cell because um that refers to the lawyer who weighed in on the topic of how does a roadway get accepted by the town. So that under Connie Kruger is correct. And what was the other one? Under Janet McGowan's, which well, I then that one's probably correct too. Yeah, that's correct also because uh, yeah. Janet McGowan mm -hmm. asked to see the town attorney's opinion. And then Ms. Mooring, Mr. Page Mooring's page the same six. above. Yeah. Was yeah, there another one? Page six, those are the attorney as well. Top of page six. It's, uh, yeah. That's great. As a non attendee, that's. Um, yeah, I thought they were typos, but apparently it's all accurate. So nice work. On well, the top of page six, it should be CIL because um, the people have to submit a petition of acceptance to town CIL council. Yeah. And the second paragraph also has town CIL in two places. And then the next paragraph has town SEL, and that's right because I forwarded something that the town attorney had sent so <laughs> okay well i'm going to thank you johanna for reading it so closely all right so chris i see your hand up do you want to say anything else yes i was um wondering if people didn't have a chance to see the latest version of the minutes, which went out this afternoon, I wanted to ask Pam if she would bring up um, the minutes. People may have seen the one that was in the packet. And um, Janet emailed me, I think it was yesterday, pointing out a few things that she felt needed to be corrected. So um, I did correct them. And the first one is on page three. And it is under Hilda Greenbaum's comments where mm -hmm. um, she was commenting about students in North Amherst and many students rather than any students was the correct um, terminology. And then um, moving down the page, um, Mr. Marshall said that he wanted a, a chart to describe the um, changes that were being proposed um, to make Article 14 a permanent situation. So there was some back and forth um, I came up with what I thought was uh, a, a version and I sent it out to Doug to see if he agreed with that version and he didn't think he had been as specific as I made it sound. So I um, revised it again to say that Doug Marshall would like a chart with the five categories of uses and he would like the chart to contain how these uses are approved now and how they are proposed to be changed. And then um, Janet, um, wanted a more full explanation of how that would be done. And so in 
brackets because that wasn't really said at the meeting, but it was in my head. I laid out a pathway to create this chart, and this is going to help my staff in creating the chart. And I, I think it's a reasonable summary of the steps that need to be taken. And since I had it on the top of my mind, I just um, included it in brackets, indicating that it wasn't actually said at the um, planning board meeting, but this is what planning staff understood would be needed. So I hope that you all um, think this is okay. And there was one more change, which was to, um, on page seven, under new business, uh, we were talking about the scope of work for a consultant to help us determine whether the parking garage could hold another story. And I believe that I did say um, that we would also be assessing other sites for a parking garage, as well as um, the Boltwood garage. And that would be planning staff would be doing that, not the consultant. So those are the changes that, um, that we've made since you received your packets. Thank you, Chris. Bruce, I see your hand. Yeah, just to say, Doug, that I like what uh, Christine has done, um, uh, adding something in parentheses. Uh, I wonder whether uh, a useful convention uh, for doing that might be to put the text in italics as well as putting it in parentheses so that it's very clear then that it's uh, different. It's just a thought. I think we'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> uh, Janet. Thank you for doing that, Chris. Um, I know we had made a bunch of comments about what we'd like to see in the chart, so it was kind of confusing. Um, I wonder in the in the bracketed part, you could just write staff note, you know, and that will be just kind of, it is a staff note, it, you know, and so I just, I thought it was important to kind of highlight just because I thought it was important information that we wanted at the next hearing, but everybody like had, you know, a little version of what they wanted to see. So I think that does capture it. Okay. All right, thank you, Janet. Andrew, welcome. And I think I saw you come in at 6.41 PM. I wanted to put that in the mm -hmm. record. Yeah, just wanna let you know I was here. Thank Got you. It. And I, this is the first time I'm seeing this. I did not get a chance to look at my email today, so. Okay, sure. thank you, thank you, Andrew. All right, Chris. So you've gotten a couple of comments about the revisions you made, and I assume you're okay with those and can mm -hmm. incorporate them into the record copy. Yep. All right, uh, board members, are there any other comments people would like to make before we go to a vote? All right, Johanna, you had sounded like you wanted to make a motion. I move to approve the minutes from July 20th. Move to approve. Thank you very much. Uh, Janet, is that your second? Yes, peace symbol second. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you both. Okay, we'll go right to the roll call vote. Um, have a new, new list of, of participants. Uh, Bruce. Uh, you are muted. Mm, still muted. Usually hitting the space bar unmutes, but it didn't do it that time. I, I approve. Okay, thank you, Bruce. And Tom? Approve. Andrew? I'm going to abstain just since I just saw him. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Janet. Approve. And Johanna. Aye. And Karen. I approve. And I'm an approve as well. So six votes in favor, one abstention, and the minutes for as revised for July 20th are approved. All right, the time is 6.46. And we'll go on to the next item on the agenda, which is the public comment period. And let's see here. So at this time, the public is invited to comment about uh, something or a topic that is not on tonight's agenda. We have two items on tonight's agenda. One is a sign 
uh, down on University Drive. And the second is a proposed project uh, in Olympia Place. Uh, and so we, did, or we are not taking comments on those two topics at this time, but comments on other items are welcome. Uh, I see one hand, uh, Pam, could you bring Pam Rooney over? Pam, could you give us your name and your address? Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street, thank you. Um, since you're on the topic of meeting minutes, um, thank you very much, Pam, for putting those all together. They're very, very helpful and, and comprehensive. I was trying to, since the, since the meeting minute is posted, obviously, after the meeting, there's a very nice, um, what appears to be a, uh, an interactive link sending someone to the recordings of the meeting and or to the meeting minutes themselves. Um, but of course, as a PDF, they don't work as, a, as an interactive link. So mm -hmm. when, when I go to the meeting minutes and I click clerk, I am not able to, in fact, pull up the meeting minutes from that previous two or three meetings back. And it, it gives a listing. Now, it could be I'm doing it wrong, but it gives a listing of the number like 1491. Mm -hmm. So then I had to go back into town documents 1492, and it was probably the fourth or fifth or sixth item within town documents that actually was the packet for that week. And I just wonder if it might be possible um, to include, uh, I know, um, and I'm not trying to make this harder. I know that uh, for several of the council committees, there's actually a listing of the items that are in a packet for that evening um, to give, you know, so you could quickly scan through and say, oh yeah, that's the archipelago, you know, 11 East Pleasant Street hearing, um, just as a kind of a, an easy reference. So give it some thought um, and maybe that it could be worked out, that it makes it a little bit easier for folks trying to track things. Thanks. Pam, thank you. We've worked really hard on those links. Are you finding that consistently they're not working for you? Oops, am I still on? Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I had. I thought I had muted myself back. Um, I just went to the ones that were presented for this week. Okay. And and the, I guess because it was a because it was a PDF maybe and it it just it wasn't opening for me. That's interesting. Thank you for letting us know. Um, but if you control click, um, I'm going to take a look at it and I'll get IT to take a look at it with me. Um, so thanks for bringing that to our attention for this one. You know, with IT, things can work, 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 work. And then all of a sudden there can be a, an oops, like a little floss. So thank you for letting me know and we'll take a look at it. Okay, thank you, Pam. And Absolutely. I'll, try it, I'll try it with other meeting minutes as well, just to see if maybe I'm, I'm the one that's not working. It could be, we'll see, we'll check it out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any, yes, Janet. I wonder if I can chime in that people have complained to me about that problem um, where they haven't been able to get to the packet through the link. And I should have told you earlier. Sometimes I just send them the packet. Okay. All right. Thank you, Janet. All right. I, I don't see any other hands from the attendees of the public. So I will assume that we are done with public comment period. Yeah. All right. The time now is 6.51. <clears throat> And uh, I know that the next item on the agenda is the public hearing for Archipelago Investments Project. However, we received a request from the, uh, from the folks who are representing uh, Papa John's to, to, to go on to the signage uh, review for their, new, for their restaurant over at 181 University Drive. So I wondered, uh, unless any, do, do any board members object to going to the signage before we go to the uh, Archipelago project? 
Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so we will do that. So the time now is 6.51 and we'll go to item four. This is SPR 2005-00001, Amherst Shopping Center, Big Y Plaza. And this is a, let's see, let me see if I've got the, the text for this. I do not. So yeah, this is just a review of the signage for the new Papa John's restaurant in the, in the mall or the shopping center. Uh, Chris, do you want to introduce this? Yes, I would like to. Um, there were two um, references to approvals for this site, the Big Y Shopping Center. Um, the first one was in, I think it was 1985. And then um, this latest one was 2005. And both of them um, contained a condition that um, signs for this big white plaza would come back to the planning board for review and approval before they're installed. So that's what this is all about. So Papa John's is putting in a new um, store where uh, Supercuts used to be, which that was a, like a barber shop. And now they're um, proposing to have a restaurant there and they want to put a sign over the door of the restaurant and they also want to put a sign on that big monument sign um, that is a freestanding sign out in the parking lot and we have um, Rosalind Holderfield here tonight to uh, describe the signs to us and she's from the sign manufacturer. Okay thanks Chris and welcome Rosalind. Hi uh, good evening how's everyone? Very well. So do you have, do you want to show us some images? Yes, let me see if I can uh, screen share. And Okay, Rosalind, we can we can see your email at the moment. Oh, I'm. I'm so you, may, you may need to select a different screen or move the images. Now we can see your desktop. There you go. Okay. Here there we go. Good. All right. Give <laughs> me a minute. I apologize. Uh, mm -hmm. right, so this is a bird's eye view of the uh, shopping center, and it shows where our proposal uh, for the Papa John's is going to be and then where the existing uh, monument sign is, is going. Uh, we are going to be taking over the old supercuts, okay? And we're proposing to add a Papa John's, better ingredients, better pizza uh, sign that is comparable to what the supercuts used to have up there. Uh, our building height uh, up to the bottom of the cornice is about 13.9. So actually there's probably about another eight or 12 inches there. Uh, we've got a lease space that's about 14 feet, eight inches. So our signage is at 17.16 square feet and uh, our allowance uh, is a little over a, a 20 square feet. So this is uh, within code compliance uh, for that. And y'all just stop me if you have any questions. The next exhibit uh, is going to show uh, the freestanding sign, which is existing. We're still in negotiations as finding out from the landlord if we'll be allowed to take over a half panel spot or a full panel spot. So what we want to do is go ahead and present both options to you, let you review it, see if you have any comments about that, if, uh, and whichever one that the landlord <clears throat> will allow us to go with, uh, obviously, that one would be already approved via you, hopefully. So that is it pretty much in a nutshell. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is this, is there any lighting integral with either of these signs? Uh, yes, sir. So the Papa John's uh, will all be internally illuminated, and that is via LED illumination. The freestanding signs, uh, whatever illumination is currently uh, for that sign, uh, this sign will also illuminate at night. All right, thank you. Uh, board members, any questions on these, uh, these proposals?
talkative bunch tonight. So, so is the the sign on? Oh, sorry. Is the sign on the freestanding one inside within our code requirements? I know we have a lot of detailed sign requirements that I haven't memorized in any way. So uh, I'm unsure if there's any restrictions as far as uh, our size. We would be taking over what the supercuts used to have in, in this exhibit here. Okay? Right. So we'll be matching up what was pre existing before. Uh, this one, uh, obviously, we would be taking over a full space. So we're not encroaching or increasing the physical structure of the sign, nor that uh, particular panel. Right. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Did you want to comment on this? Yes, I wanted to comment that the monument sign as a whole was approved by the planning board when they approved the Big Y Plaza. But um, figuring out exactly whose names are going to go in those slots is really up to the um, people who own the, the plaza to have a conversation with their new tenants and figure out how big a sign should be there. So um, there aren't any regulations, as Janet asked for. Yes. OK, thank you. All right, any other comments or questions from board members? All right, uh, Chris, do we need to vote on this or if there's, is there any action, other action needed? I would like you to vote on it if you would, yep. Okay. All right, Andrew. Motion to, excuse me, motion to approve the signage package. Thank you. Anybody want to go on record seconding, Tom? I'll second. I'll second, no, okay, fine. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, any further discussion? Any comment from the public? I don't see any. All right, we'll go through a, another roll call vote. Uh, Bruce. Uh, vote to approve. Thank you. And Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? That looked like an aye, but you were muted. Aye. Thank you. And I'm an aye as well. The vote is unanimously in favor. Great. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. May I make a request? Sure. I believe that the uh, images that um, Ms. Holderfield showed tonight had dimensions on them that I don't think I have. So I just would ask her to forward those images to me so that I have the um, exact images that you approved. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Be happy thank to. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. At this time, we'll go on to our next or really the previous item in the agenda. Uh, number three, the time now is seven o'clock. So this is a joint public hearing and I'll read uh, the intro. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Site Plan Review 2023-01 and Special Permit 2023-01, uh, both with Archipelago Investments LLC, 47 Olympia Drive. This is a joint public hearing to request Site Plan Review approval under Section 3.326 of the zoning bylaw to construct a private apartment style dormitory with 68 dwelling units and associated interior and exterior spaces and associated site improvements, including waiver of on-site parking requirements and a special permit to modify maximum building coverage and height requirements under section six, table three, footnote A of the zoning bylaw. 
parcel is on map 8D, parcel number 18 in the RF zoning district. So we'll start by seeing if there are any board disclosures. Okay, so I am actually gonna uh, make a disclosure. Um, I obviously work for University of Massachusetts and um, I believe that I can be fair and impartial in my deliberations with you all, but I wanted to put that on the record. And I have submitted a, the disclosure form to uh, the town council president and to the town manager as required by the state law. So um, with that, I guess we have the disclosures completed. All right, um, Chris, I don't see, oh, there's your image. Um, do you want to introduce this at all or should we go right to uh, Mr. Wilson? Um, why don't we go right to Mr. Wilson and also you might, I don't know if he wants to bring in Dave Williams as well, because Dave is a kind of partner on this project. I'm trying to, Chris, and I can't, I don't know what, what's going on if he's on the telephone. Okay, one has come over. You brought him in, Pam. He's, he's here. He's listed twice. So, Kyle, do you, can you shed any light on that for me? There he is. There he is. Okay, there he is. Yeah. Anybody else, Mr. Wilson? Okay, it looked like he said no. Gotcha. No, thank you. Gotcha. Okay, I, um, Kyle and Dave, I guess it's your show to go ahead and share your slides. Great, thank you. Um, I will share the screen to get started. Kyle and Dave might want to introduce themselves. Sure, thank you, Chris. Uh, Kyle Wilson from Archipelago Investments. And you can, Dave Williams also from Archipelago. Um, I could get started here with the uh, architectural presentation of 47 Olympia. Um, so on my screen is uh, the architectural set. Uh, this project is next door to the 57 Olympia project that we opened in fall of 2016. It, um, as that was a former fraternity, this is a, uh, a sorority site. It's all part of the fraternity sorority park from the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, south of us is uh, Mather Building for UMass, which was UMass Admissions. Uh, and this is the rendering, uh, the front rendering facing street. Uh, we've got, as, as mentioned, uh, it is 68 apartments. Um, uh, it is a site that is about the same size as the site uh, that we developed next door, 57 Olympia, which is an acre. Um, uh, you can see this site has uh, two residential bars and a connector bar, which is uh, all the amenity space for the building. And there's a service bar on the south side of the building. Uh, the south side of the building is the highest part of the building relative to grade. So all the grade drops as it heads down towards uh, 57 Olympia. And you can see the access into the courtyard. Um, the two residential bars have a strip of solar panels facing south and the electric air source heat pumps uh, and um, uh, a hot water uh, and uh, uh, facing you know, behind that uh, on the north. Uh, we've got two diagrams showing uh, lot and building coverage. Um, you can see the lot coverage at 56%, and then you see the building coverage uh, at 45.35%. So that's our one of our dimensional special permits is we're 0.35 over. Um, uh, and you can see uh, how those sit on the site relative to setbacks. Uh, this is the basic floor plan, uh, the uh, first floor plan. Uh, you'll see two stairs that face the courtyard. You'll see an entry. Uh, that, that caps the courtyard in the amenity uh, uh, amenity connector, as we're calling it. The two elevators are in the middle, and then you've got uh, residential that, that is in each of the bar buildings. And on the ground floor south wing, we have storage, plumbing, trash, electric, fire pump because the water pressure is a little low, et cetera. All that occurs on the south side. 
and you'll see the gray box that is our uh, generator that is just outside the fire pump and trash container room. Second floor, uh, all the residential stacks, there's uh, some apartments above, the storage below, and then you'll see in the amenity space, there's a, uh, a stair that comes up, there's a meeting area, uh, there's fitness on a number of different levels that is yet to be programmed, but some will have machines, some will have places to stretch, uh, et cetera. Um, you see electrical data on each closet and then uh, the unit layouts. Again, on the upper floor, uh, the only thing that changes is the amenities. There's some breakout rooms and a fitness room on floor three. Same thing on floor four and on floor five, there's a fitness room and, uh, and no breakout spaces and you can see the corridor. Uh, this is the roof plan showing the ERVs and the mechanical, uh, mechanical and solar, uh, the elevator overrun and um, uh, where we're at, sorry, where we're estimating the roof drains to go over the corridors. Uh, here are the elevations. So the building is uh, wrapped in uh, wood cladding uh, with uh, uh, a very large uh, gla glazing to cladding ratio, uh, as much as we could take it and, and still meet all the energy goals that we have. You can see the height of the building relative to the average grade at the street. You can see on this upper elevation how the south side on the right is higher than the north side on the left and how that grade uh, pitches down. Um, where the gray, where the foundation is exposed, that's the elevation that's facing our building next door, 57 Olympia. Uh, and you can see on the uh, rendered elevation to the north, uh, that's the facade that faces 57 Olympia. Uh, again, you can see the rendered elevation on the south where we're cutting into the grade to make the slab work. There's one unified slab uh, for accessibility across the whole first, second, third, fourth, and fifth floor with no ramps. Um, and then you can see the back elevation that faces the conservation land uh, on the rendered elevation to the east. Uh, this rendering makes the facade look black. Uh, in the middle, it is horizontally mounted wood uh, that is stained uh, uh, or has the, uh, the, the burned uh, finish to it, but it is a, a wood finish uh, in the center of that east elevation facing the conservation area. A uh, couple more elevations of the courtyard uh, um, and the other, uh, the interior courtyard elevations that show the, the stairwells that will be lit, uh, will be active, uh, engaging people to use the stairs to drop down and occupy the courtyard on both sides, on the north elevation, south elevation within the courtyard. And then we've got a couple of renderings. Uh, this one is from the street. Uh, again, you can see the building standing tall, the wood cladding. Uh, the large glass windows, you can see how the grade steps, the entry to the courtyard, um, and how the building as it goes back in the courtyard opens up and goes back towards the amenity uh, connector. Uh, this is from the amenity connector uh, looking out. This rendering doesn't exactly match our landscape, uh, which we hope to update for your next meeting, but uh, the intent is the same, is that we have this landscape courtyard that is accessible and usable um, by all the folks and the tenants in the building uh, and creates an amenity space that allows people to gather, come out of the stairs, come out of this uh, connector corridor. If you're connecting from one residential side to the other, if you're using the elevators and crossing over, you always uh, look west into this courtyard or look east into uh, the conservation area. Um, this is a view to the back where you can uh, hopefully kind of see the horizontal wood um, represented in the rendering, which shows the step down and uh, the, uh, the elevation facing, uh, facing uh, west. Uh, the next is uh, some, some basic materials for wood, uh, the cedar wood screening and the black and metal panel that we'd use on the, uh, around the windows. Um, I will take you into, I'll leave this open. Take you into civil quickly. Uh, existing conditions from SVE. So this is the existing Chi Omega sorority uh, that sits on the site. This is the parking across the street. Uh, to the north is our 57 Olympia Drive building uh, with the bus stop and then the parking uh, uh, to the northwest. Uh, you can see um, and we can discuss this. You can see the wetland uh, location um, as it relates to 57 Olympia that we previously developed and as it relates to this building. 
Um, you can see that we 50 foot buffer just touches the northeast corner of this property. The 100 foot buffer comes in about 55 feet, um, uh, much less in both cases than uh, the building before. Um, this is the site plan showing where that building sits. Uh, that that building does go into the 100 foot buffer, but does not go into the 50 foot buffer uh, as 57 Olympia did. Shows the, uh, the site, uh, the paving layout and some of the grading challenges that we're looking to uh, meet and make work on the site. Um, again, some additional topo to show how we're dealing with the stormwater and making all the grades work. Don't need to get too far into this. Uh, some of the more civil and, and stormwater issues and then some of the ways we're dealing with retaining the uh, stormwater on site. Um, and then I wanted to show you a couple more, not the least necessarily. I did want to discuss parking uh, and I wanted to show this image here. So these are a couple of Google images of the site. Um, so this is looking uh, towards the site past the Mather building. Uh, and you can see 57 Olympia in the background. You can see the, the parking spaces that are along Mather Drive uh, on the left-hand side of the page here. Looking up from uh, 57 Olympia, uh, past the transformer that is on the 47 Olympia site, uh, you can see how the one-way street comes down the hill uh, towards 57 Olympia. And then this is the view above, showing Mather in the center, uh, showing 57 Olympia, and between that would be 47 Olympia. Uh, and this shows the overall layout of the previous fraternity sorority park, which has Olympia Drive, Authority Way, uh, Mather, and uh, the sites that are uh, used and deeded for parking and uh, recreation. And then I want to show this, which we presented a while back, uh, back in 2014, uh, about 57 Olympia, and it's uh, uh, the same for 47 Olympia. These are the one, two, three, four, five sites uh, that are um, uh, used for parking right now, an approximate number of spaces uh, that are used there, uh, its location relative to 47 and 57 Olympia, uh, and um, uh, how they lay out in this previously developed fraternity sorority park location. Um, I think with that, I wanted to actually, let me pull up landscape real, uh, I'll come back to landscape because that represents the renderings rather than the, the plans above. So if there's landscape questions, we can refer to that. I know we still have some lighting and photometric plans to update, so that'll be a part of it. Um, but I think with that, I'd like to open it up to questions and, and do more answering and less talk. All right, thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Um, Chris? I noticed in the uh, development report, development application report that you mentioned, there were a number of town individuals and, and entities who had not commented on this yet. Um, is it your expectation that we will continue this hearing this evening until we have all that information? That is my recommendation, that you continue the public hearing until you hear from the town engineer the fire department and the conservation commission. Okay, so um, so I'm going to kind of con consider this hearing this this section this uh, discussion this evening as basically an introduction to the project for us to get familiar with it and um, ask whatever initial questions we have, and then we'll continue when we have more information from the town bodies, and uh, we may come back with additional. Uh, questions on at the, the later meetings. All right, so Kyle, I okay, Johanna, why don't you go ahead? Sure, thanks, Doug. Um, Kyle, this is really exciting. There are a lot of elements of this that I think are really just elegant and beautiful. Um, I have, I feel like I'm a old dog, but um, I have two questions. So I'm excited that you have solar on site. I'm curious what percent of the building's projected electricity usage actually will be produced on site. Um, and then I'm also curious about whether there are other fuel sources um, besides electricity. Um, Cause I know at some of the projects downtown, there was a need to be hooked up to gas um, 
for the kind of peak in water heating. And I wanted to just see if that was um, going to be the case with this site as well, or whether you've managed to figure out a way to do it using all electricity. Sure. Um, and thank you. Uh, one of the things I did leave out is the construction type of this building is a hybrid mass timber. Um, we're going to do panelized wood walls, which are little sticks, and then we're going to do uh, pre-manufactured CLT decking for the floor system. Uh, the connector itself will be more of a traditional uh, post and beams, you know, heavy timber, uh, mass timber building. Uh, so with that and the mechanicals, all the heating and cooling for our buildings is all electric already. Uh, the domestic hot water has been the lag on that. Uh, we've always needed gas or propane to um, to solve for everybody potentially taking a shower at the same time. Um, there's a new technology that we're deploying downtown that we want to deploy here as well, which is CO2 based all electric heat pumps for domestic hot water, which is great. Um, we're excited that that technology is finally available. Um, it's likely that we have one big couple hundred thousand BTU hot water uh, heat pump on the roof of one bar and one on the other. Um, it increases our storage needs in the ground floor. So that's why we've got a little more space on the ground floor on the south floor of that to hold those tanks. So um, we still do have a generator uh, shown on the south for life safety, which will be fossil fuel based. Uh, but our hope is that everything else, the heating, the cooling and the hot water uh, is all electric uh, uh, when we open this building. Uh, with the solar facing south as the roof screen, um, it is a, and all of the, all of the heating, cooling, and domestic hot water, all being electric, you know, the solar makes a small dent in the overall electric needs of the building. Um, in order to provide for all of them, we'd have to, uh, we, we'd need more, you know, there's, there's, there's not enough roof space to accommodate for all of that. Um, so the hope is to continue what we do here where we buy, you know, we're fortunate in Massachusetts where you can buy green energy very efficiently. Um, so to supplement the solar on site with uh, some effectively purchased uh, energy from uh, Eversource or similar. All right. Um, Johanna, does that, you have any additional questions? Nope. Okay, thank you. Go on to Andrew. Excuse me, thanks, Doug. Thanks uh, for the presentation, Kyle. I have two. Um, Two quick questions. I guess starting with the comment. Also, I mean, looks looks stunning. Um, very impressive. Um, very creative. I think in terms of how using the the connector space between the buildings. Um, there's probably the materials, and I just overlooked it. Where there's a lot of pages in there. The intended tenant um, is going to be students, or it's open to the UMass community, or it's open to anybody. Uh, it is students, matriculating students. Okay. All right. And then um, I was just curious if you could go into a little more detail on the parking, because I know you're looking for that waiver. Uh, I see there's a lot of spots. Um, do you, I guess, have you connected with the university yet? Any sense of um, whether those spaces would meet, you know, the current capacity plus this new capacity? Uh, so... We're fortunate that we've been able to operate 57 Olympia since 16. Um, the university has been great to work with in terms of the lots across the street. Um, there've been improvements to that. There've been improvements to the street lights and uh, some rocks gone down and paving and plowing and all that stuff, which is always tricky. Um, we also have uh, three bus loops that now pass through here, 34, 35 and 36 on PVTA. So in addition to the campus loops, now this also links up to the, the loop that bring, brings you down to Atkins, um, which is great. Um, our, uh, um, I, our sense is we have had no problems with the parking here whatsoever, um, that the UMass has retreated somewhat from Mather relative to uh, what we've noticed in terms of uh, parking loads up on the Chi Omega, the upper lot here. And we think with uh, we think that there's there's plenty of parking uh, as it stands, and that the relationship that we've set up with a unique history here between our buildings and uh, the property that is uh, that is we have deed of rights to, but that UMass is maintaining and the tenants purchasing UMass parking permits uh, seems to work very well. Okay, I mean happy to see or hear that that there's a great relationship there. It seems to me like there would be enough capacity, but I think. 
you know, certainly for the next time we connect <clears throat> would be great to have a little bit more definitive statement from the from the university on how um, how you can make this, you know, be um, a bit more codified, I guess, right, in terms of what you'd actually have access to. But again, um, exciting project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Tom, you're next. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Um, thank you. I actually really appreciate this building as well. Um, I did have a question about parking to follow that up, but um, to move on, my other question was in regard to um, this connector. I'm looking at the west view or the the view of the back, looking west um, in our packet. It's it's PR. 40.03. Um, and what I love, I love seeing people in the ground uh, outside here in this connection. I'm just wondering if this is accessible and, and how, um, uh, you know, because of the grade change, I see stairs, I see a railing. Um, and I'm just curious if there is a way for people to get out here um, in an accessible way. Uh, so um, what we, all of our buildings are pet friendly. And what we've noticed at 57 Olympia is there's a lot of pets and there's a lot of folks that do a loop. Uh, when we developed 57 Olympia, it was shortly after Blarney blowout. And there were a lot of concerns about access to a courtyard and, and all the consternation that may come from that. Um, we're fortunate, obviously, none of that's occurred at Olympia and we don't see that occurring. Uh, again, so uh, the thinking here is that this is for tenants. Um, if they want to access uh, this back area, uh, that there is an ability to do so. Um, and that if there's an informal loop that wraps that building, that you could also come out to this back patio or come down to uh, uh, the backyard. Uh, Kyle? Yeah. I, I interpreted Tom's comment as, is there an actual accessible route? Yeah, handicap accessibility. For handicapped you know, people in a wheelchair who are your tenants to get to this exterior area? Uh, I think that the, um, I think that the accessible access to that is either on the south side, uh, which we would do through the landscaping or would be on a, uh, a ramp from this back stair in the rendering shown here. So, Tom, would you like to see that uh, illustrated? Yeah, I'd, I'd like, yeah, I think I'd like to have a better understanding of, of that. I mean, because I do think it's, um, you know, I, I like the, the greenery in the interior courtyard. I think it's quite beautiful, um, but it's a kind of uh, manufactured landscape. And, and in a way, this, this is probably one of the more beautiful views of your building and from your building. And, and I, you know, if, if some people have access to that space, I'd like to see all people have access to that space in some way. So this is something um, I would hope to see. I, I agree with that. And I think uh, on subsequent, our 45.36 might be a little larger as we look to integrate a ramp into that. Okay. Thanks, Tom. And uh, the discussion reminded me that we skipped over our site visit report. And uh, I know that Bruce and Janet and I were at the site visit yesterday. I don't think I missed anybody else who was there. Um, Bruce or Janet, do you do either of you want to give the overview of the site visit report? I'll defer to Janet. <laughs> I was just about to nominate Bruce. Um, I actually. I thought this backyard was more sloping. So I was kind of hoping somebody could jump on, jump in on that. But so we did visit the site yesterday. And the first thing that was noted was that the, the address of, I think it's 47 Olympia Drive, the building is actually on Mather Drive. And so a lot of us were in the wrong place for a while trying to get to that. And so um, I was hoping that would be remedied some way, but that's not a site visit. Um, the, we saw the old building, which was um, kind of very 80s looking. Um, you know, we, we talked about the slope and I think Doug had some comments about, you know, 
handicapped accessibility from the parking lot right in front and where the um, building where the slope would be corrected. And then we talked about the length, the size of the re retaining wall. My re recollection, which might be wrong, is that the site slopes down in the back, down into the wetland, into a conservation area. Um, and it was hard to see the ends of the property because they were sort of far away and um, mapping wasn't great. So um, anyway, so that, that was, that part. Um, the site is filled with mature trees. I think it sounded like most of them would come down. Um, it's very close to the building, Mather building, and it, it wasn't really that visible to see. It's right, I mean, it's right next to um, Olympia Place, so obviously very visible to the residents of Olympia Place. Um, it looked like people in um, Olympia Oaks, which is a, um, a, a affordable housing community and back would not see this this building and can hardly see Olympia Place during the time of green leaves, but it would be very visible when those leaves were down. Um, there's also another community on the street next to, which somebody has to help me with the name of, um, that is fairly well screened both by deciduous and um, evergreens. Bruce, please jump in. <laughs> um. Yes, can, I could can, add uh, if 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 that's okay, Doug. Sure. Um, everything that Janet says, and then I'll add uh, a couple of things. First, I think I was struck by the uh, we, as, as Janet said, we we went around the existing uh, sorority building, which is really abandoned pretty much. So it was a bit like walking around a ruin. It's a smaller footprint. But it's um, it's a big enough building that you get the sense of a big building, a big foot, a building on the site with the perimeter. I was struck by the uh, the conservation area, which is on the diagram we're looking at now to the right, and uh, there will be a potentially, I think, a very interesting uh, contrast uh, between the what will probably be a, a quite uh, uh, groomed. Uh, uh, landscape in, contained within that uh, interior triangle and quite a wild uh, landscape that will be connected to the site through the, the end that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the rear that Tom was asking about accessibility to. And I think I would really support uh, the um, introduction of a ramp so that it truly was code compliant accessible um, even for folks who can only get down into that level to experience the, uh, the, 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 the conservation area and for others who can walk into it, it's, it's really a, um, it's, a, it's, it's an open space uh, amenity here. So one of the questions that I would have uh, later is the, uh, is it has to do with open space, but we have to, I think, remember that we, there is this uh, protected uh, um, open space uh, out behind the building. The other thing that we did, uh, I think that at Dave's invitation, we went into the neighboring building. And uh, that was quite uh, an eye opener for me anyway. I, uh, I guess because of the concrete pavements that I had seen around, I, hadn't, I wasn't really ready for the uh, rather elegantly uh, uh, upscale interiors, which I imagine now will be similar in this building. But it is, um, of all that glass that uh, Carl was talking about earlier that you can look out and there's certainly something to look out to here. Um, it's uh, um, so those two uh, additional um, experiences from the site visit uh, were uh, inf influential to me in helping me understand uh, what's being proposed here. All right, um, thank you, Bruce. I, and thank you, Janet. Anything oh, else? I wanted to throw to also add the parking lots. I don't know, Kyle, if you can put up the picture of all the parking lots again. Um, going down Olympia Drive, it's kind of an eccentric space because as you go down, there's like a lot of lots that are owned by UMass. I mean, just lot lots and um, kind of looks like a storage area, some, some different construction equipment. But the area does have a lot of very large parking lots. Um, there's one right across from the Mather Build. There's parking spaces across in the Mather building. There's parking slightly behind that. There's there's a dirt parking lot to the left of Olympia Place. Yeah. 
And then um, there's this giant one, which also looks like dirt. So there's there's quite a bit parking. We talked about um, what I found very confusing and couldn't follow in the documents, but um, this was a subdivision where all the um, lots were deeded access to the parking lots, um, the, the land for either parking or recreational use. And um, Mr. Wilson felt like that would guarantee parking for um, the people of Olympic Place, Olympia Place and 47 Olympia Drive. And so that um, was an issue. So there's there's like a legal right for, of access and use of those. But currently the residents of Olympia Place are applying to UMass for parking permits. Okay. Thank you, Janet, and thank you, Bruce. I, I think you covered everything and I really don't have anything to add. Um, Bruce, you had your hand up next uh, for uh, with another comment, I think, or a question. I've got, I've got some questions, uh, Doug. Um, the, uh, uh, I think um, Johanna asked whether there was fossil fuels on site and, and Kyle said both yesterday evening and uh, a moment ago that the answer was yes, but it wasn't clear whether that was gas or whether it was uh, diesel or some, uh, what was going to power the generator. It's, I think we understand uh, correctly that the only device that will be fossil fuel powered or energized will be the generator. Is that, um, uh, is that a diesel? Uh, or a gas. Um, um, what are we uh, storage-wise? What what are we dealing with? Uh, so I, it's it's the first time I've done a generator that's own that would be the only fossil fuel fired device. So yeah. previously, it's always been propane, uh, yeah. which we like to maintain. I don't know if that's a hundred gallon propane tank or a thousand. I can't imagine it's a thousand because we only have two thousand for all of Olympia next door. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like it to be propane. I haven't done all the numbers to make sure that it doesn't turn into a uh, a diesel generator, but our intent would be to make it propane. Thank you. Um, the uh, next question has to do with the height. You're asking for a height waiver. And the image that was put on when Tom was asking his question about accessibility to the rear, um, uh, that and the diagrams, it, it seemed to me that uh, you're only asking for one foot eight, uh, uh, a waiver for an additional one foot eight inches of height. And it seems to me, we can see this uh, from this diagram where in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, there's, there's about 10 feet of uh, exposed wall at the back. And my, my guess is that you could grade this building to make it comply but that would mean uh, diminishing the uh, use utility of that back space that uh, we all i think are feeling is potentially quite a lovely place so would i be right in understanding that the 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 one foot eight inches of additional height would be mostly or entirely due to wanting to maintain a, a relatively level area at the back and not put a, a grade in that would um, maybe comply with the height restrictions, but render the rear of the site, um, well, not useless, but it would uh, subvert the, it would, in, it would impede the general utility of the rear of the site. Yeah, yes, and I think you've got it exactly. And I think making sure that that courtyard also doesn't become a pond uh as we drop down to a lower slab height that would lower the ceiling height with the um clt members we are going to have to have some intermediate beams in some way shape or form um there is a thickness to the gypcrete that goes on the clt deck so we've got a little bit more of a floor structure and structural entity that we're that we're balancing so we've got a floor to floor that accommodates the new mass timber uh framing yeah. and then like you said once we make the grades work in the front, it creates a nice situation in the back uh, that we well, we'd obviously uh, like to maintain. So broadly, I'm going to. It I, I, I sounds like I'll be correct in understanding that the additional uh, one foot eight inches uh, of height gets us uh, a, a more usable uh, rear 
uh, area abutting the conservation and it sounds also like it is uh, enabling a rather um, well, I like that uh, this CLT, the, the uh, cross laminated timber uh, technology, uh, and the advent of that is pretty much the only re regret I have from retiring when I did that I didn't get to build buildings using that technology, which I, I've seen in other countries and, and chased after, but it's really lovely. And that leads to my next question, which is. Um, is this uh, cross laminated uh, timber that's going to be used for the floor decks? Um, the is the timber going to be exposed uh, as a ceiling uh, in the floors below, or are you going to put uh, uh, some kind of acoustic tile um, and cover it up? The goal is to do all the acoustics from above and expose the wood from below. So there's like four inches of gyp creep that go on top of these and then uh but you'll see the wood from within the unit at your ceiling yeah well the jip jip rig is a is going to give you the the the, the structure borne noise a separation from one floor to the next which sounds like you've really got a good solid shift there and the, uh, the the airborne noise will be you went you went to put acoustic tiles in which is so you'll be able to see the wood is what i'm after and it sounds like that's what you're trying to do and yeah that that uh that's all to the good as far as I can see. As um, much as we can expose, we will, even in stairwells, if, if we're able to make the code work. Good, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I, it's a question that uh, had been posed uh, by the staff uh, that we might wish to inquire about the, uh, your plans so far as bicycles are concerned. Uh, so what provision, uh, what support of uh, bicycles uh of people who want to because how many how many people here we've got uh, uh 68 200, 230 tenants so 230 bicycles you if you've got room for 230 bicycles uh we do not have room for 230 bicycles um we've well, let's uh, look back from there <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I think we, we have to look at that. Um, we have to figure out where we can accommodate that. What we've seen at Olympia is there is some use on the bikes that um, are stored on the north side of the property. Um, and we, I think, for our next visit to you, are going to look at that either on the south side or on the north side um, of, of the uh, residential bars. Um, I'll, I think I'll stop there for the moment. Uh... Um, oh, finally, the, the traffic impact study, uh, you're asking for a waiver of that. Is, is that because the traffic impact study that was done, what, six years ago is uh, considered to be current? Uh, no, I, I think that the, obviously the traffic and the parking are all part and parcel of the same conversation. Uh, I think it's, it's part of a recognition that we've got a history of a, of a very similar project next door and that uh, we haven't seen any traffic or, or parking issues as a result of that being in operation for six years. Uh, but that being said, uh, uh, Van Ass Associates, who did the last one, I've talked to Sean, he'd be willing to do another one if we uh, saw fit. Okay. All right. I'll pass, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for the moment. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Andrew, I see your hand, but I, I had a couple comments uh, related to the height and um, thought it, this would be a good thing to follow up on right after Bruce. So, and, so Kyle, the first thing I, I, is it, my understanding is that the measurement of the height for the zoning regulations is along the street elevation. Correct. So what is done in the back of the building whether that's graded or filled or sloped or stepped or whatever, really has no effect on the measurement of the average height along the street. Is, is, is that so? I, I know Bruce thinks, you know, he, he was hoping or thought that there was a connection between the height and the grading in the rear of the building. I guess I, I view that as kind of a tenuous relationship. It, I mean, you could drop the front of the building in order to lessen the slopes at the back, I guess, and that would reduce the height. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I think to Bruce's point, the the elevation as it relates to the uh, conservation of the back is a is a is not negative. It's positive, I think. Uh, so it's it's a it's a positive thing. We wanted to show this line all the way through the back so we could discuss the front and the back together um, and show the average street at the at the at the street because there is a bunch of pitch, a couple of feet difference from one side to the other. Um, but you're right. It is 56.8 from the average grade of the street to the top of the roof. OK, only so relative the, to the street. So then the second question I had was you you've labeled your dimension line to the top of the roof. And I noticed that the dimension line doesn't go to the top of the parapet. Mm -hmm. So is there in fact a parapet of, I don't know, two or three feet or something, 18 inches at least around the building? Because yes. because if you blew up your rendering, it looks like that dimension line stops short of the parapet. So yes, from, this goes to the to the roof rather than top of the parapet. Okay. And there is so, a parapet above this. So and so uh, I guess I'm going to have to defer to Chris as to whether when we measure the, the height of the building along the street, whether we're measuring to the parapet or to the roof. And I gather it's your interpretation, at least, that it is the roof? Correct. That's my interpretation. Okay. That's my interpretation as well. Okay, great. To the top of the roof. So, so it really wouldn't matter how high the parapet was. If you know, if we could have a ten-foot parapet around this building, and it wouldn't affect the dimensional legality, I I believe that that is correct. Okay, all right, thank you. So those were my two comments about the height, and I'll go back. We'll go back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. <coughs> Excuse me. And mine's actually really, really quick and easy. Um, your renderings are, you know, the, the photorealistic rings, renderings are great. They're they're in really tight. I wonder if. You know, for the next time, if you we could kind of zoom some of them out, especially given you know the kind of striking architecture here and at 57. Given there's also questions about height, maybe if, if we could get like a more of a zoom out and and understand this a bit better in context would be a, would sure. be a useful visual. Sure. Thanks. Good, Andrew. Janet. Um, I have a bunch of questions. I have a question about height too. So. I understand that you measured 56 feet, eight inches to the roof height, but how how high does it go beyond that point if you count in the solar panels? Um, I mean, how tall is that? Uh, I don't know. The roof, uh, the elevator overrun is usually the tallest thing. Uh, the One of the stairs has to go up the roof and extend beyond the roof plane. Mm -hmm. uh the height of the uh solar panels and that roof screen is uh just high enough to cover the mechanical system so four or five feet from the roof rather than from the top of the parapet okay um the other question i had a bunch of other questions um one of them was um about the um space um like, you know, what was common space and what isn't common space? Like during the site visit, you said that you're adding more common space. And I was wondering if that open terrace in the back would be shared by anybody um, and in, and the inner courtyard, would that be like group space? Uh, I, I think the tenants have access to the whole property. Um, and then the intent is all this purple is, is shared common space. So you'd come in, there's reception on the right, on the left, turn to the right for the big stair. You can go out the back to the covered area. Um, all of that is all publicly accessible to every tenant. And then all the upper floors connect basically the elevators to the Northern bar and um, obviously glass on both sides. So you can see the courtyard and the conservation. Is there all like, accessible to everybody there. Is there an outdoor terrace it, or is it just, was that glassed in? Maybe I just missed saw it. I had, this covered porch is, uh, is is outdoors and covered. Okay, and so that's all accessible to everybody. Um, Correct. I I wanted to see a traffic report because when I read the old one, which was just a few, we just got a few pages. It wasn't clear when it was done, and it was sort of speculative. Um, the the engineer was assuming you know only um, thirty percent of the people would have cars, um, and that you know obviously there's bus service and people would use that to get to UMass since everybody in the building is a student. What we've been learning in the planning board is that off-campus students 
like when people do, when people um, land, you know, land management companies, property managers are assuming one car per bed per student. And so I think that if we did a traffic report um, and also looking at the parking, like how many parking permits do your tenants at Olympia Place have, um, how big, how full the lots are now in, you know, say in September, we'll have a more accurate view of how many people own cars and how many trips are made. So I would, I would look for the traffic report because um, I think the world, I don't know if the world has changed, but I do know that, you know, our, uh, most of us in the planning board understand that off the campus students have a lot of cars, even despite our um, bus service. So I, I would like to see that. Um, are you going to have like substance free floors? I, I was, I've been reading through the old um, um, permit and um, findings from the um, Olympia place. And I was wondering if you're doing similar, similar stuff here. Uh, so the question is about substance free floors. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, we have not gone that far into the management, uh, regarding substance free floors. Do you, do you have that in the, um, Olympia place? Uh, everything's non-smoking, um, <laughs> you know, the whole property, uh, That's... substance free. I don't, I don't, I can't tell you. Okay. I just read that in the old report. And then in Olympia place, you have an on-site live-in um, supervise, you know, building superintendent, and then you have 24 hour reception. Although I was told by the receptionist that that's not true in the summer since the building is quite um, empty. So Olympia Place has two people um, there all the time, usually. Is that correct? Uh, Olympia has a lot of staffing associated with it. I don't know how many there. I think when we walked in there for the site visit, you saw two of our staff that were there currently. I don't know the scheduling from Alex on, on that. But so, the intent here is that we don't have an on-site manager that lives here. Uh, we do have, uh, obviously since Olympia Place has been constructed, we've built a property management business that, that manages all of our properties. Um, that I think um, we have a partner with Alex who has done an amazing job. Um, and I think that we've got some scale now that we can continue to manage these things as well as we've managed the, the ones that we've built so far. Okay, so I think you're saying that you do have 24 hour reception during the school year and then somebody living there as a like superintendent or something, is that right? Because that's- I'm that's saying I don't have anybody at 47 Olympia living on site. And the intent is that the management here is that there's, we would staff the reception as needed. And then there is, we have 24 seven on-call management available for all of our properties. Okay, so there's not 24 hour people at the Olympia place. Okay. Uh, relative to 47 Olympia, there is not proposed uh, 24 seven people at 47 Olympia. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the building you already have. Cause that was and in I'm, the I'm, I'm talking about the one that's before us today. Okay, so, okay, so, all right. Anyway, so um, the reason I'm asking this question is just to figure out how your other building is operating. And I know that um, that was a requirement and a condition from the planning board, and as well as a requirement that they be all students. And so I have been struggling as, as uh, the other planning board did, or a previous board, and the application report is, what is a private student dormitory versus private student apartment building. And so I have looked at dictionary definitions. I have um, talked to people who lived in the building. And I think that what, you know, to me, if there's no, you know, what distinguishes an apartment building filled with students um, like Aspen Chase um, and this, you know, a, a student, you know, private student dormitory would be supervision. And so I think most parents, like most dormitories on campus have an RA, you might have um, a family living in the building or um, you know, some other adults um, with eyes on the students 24 seven and people who come into the building. And so I'm wondering at Olympia Place, if you have that in place and the building is well run and quiet, um, that seems to fit the definition to me of a private student, student dormitory. If there is no supervision, I don't see 
why this would be any different from just an apartment building filled with students. Um, and then I actually went as far to talk to the people at Birch at Housing Office about Birch Hall and another thing you, another um, complex you did at UMass and they all have, they all like some of them are just suites without kitchens and kind of like more conventional um, on-campus housing in the form of apartments or suites. So that is why I'm asking all these questions about Olympia Place because it seems to me that that kind of supervision makes it a dormitory and it actually makes it safer for students and um, you know people or visitors. So I would love to know that the management plan for your other building is being implemented since it seems so successful. Um, and I would love to see on you know 24 hour reception and someone living in the building in that and make it into a dormitory, not just an apartment building. That's a long um, statement, but I, I think that's a really important issue that we need to grapple with is how do we distinguish this from just an apartment building filled with students? And if you're in that category, your building has too many units. And I think none of us want you to be in that category. Um, so that was, I was asking for the substance free floors, but I saw that. Can, can, I, can I give you my perspective on that phrase? Um, sure, I mean, I think we have to talk about it. Well, yeah, I guess we're gonna we're gonna have to. Um, I view the this as a dormitory because it is limited to under to, to students who are enrolled or matriculated at a university, whereas the other projects that Archipelago has done, with the exception of that one next door, they are open to anyone that wants to rent from him. So the the market pool is different. And now I, I realize that some of those buildings may be predominantly students because that's the market that's he's he's attracted. But it's I think the difference here is is that it's limited. I mean he is statutorily limited uh, to only take you know having leases from and matriculated students. And and I guess when I look at a lot of the residence halls at UMass, they don't have you know, on-site supervision 24 seven. So I don't, I don't view that as a condition for becoming a dormitory. Do, at, at UMass, do they have RAs on the floor? Oh yeah. So, so there is some of that. I don't, I don't know if there's an RA in every building. When the RAs are student, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, so, I, we can come back to that, I guess. Uh, you know, or we can continue now if you want. Well, I, I would look for the con a condition of its matriculated students and then also um, 24 hour reception and you know, maybe not in the summer because it's, you know, buildings almost empty, but also an onsite live-in supervisor. And I think that Mr. Roberts has done that on some much smaller projects. And I think, you know, in this case, it's a building filled with students and people could have substance issues. There could be some you know, situations where having an adult um, in the building would be good for everybody and also particularly, you know, make it more like a dormitory. You know, I, I looked up, I can, we can look at the dormitory stuff, but, you know, I was trying to, I was struggling with the legal distinction and I thought, well, if it's a student, a private student dormitory, the expectation would be that it's kind of run like a dormitory, um, not an apartment building. And so otherwise I'm just lost. I mean, I know there's lots of apartment, student apartments in Amherst. Um, I'm not sure if they limit to students. Um, I'd have to look around to the different Aspens and things like that, um, or if they're all students, but that, you know, but if it, if they're like that, and this is like that, then I don't see really the difference. Um, let's see, I had, I had another question about, actually, I'll just hold for a minute. Okay, Jana, uh, thank you. Chris, do you want to comment on that, that conversation at all? Um, well, when Olympia Place was first introduced to us, we did struggle with this issue. Um, the Olympia Place model was likened to the dormitories that are on Eastman Lane, and I'm not exactly sure what they're called, but the they were then the new dorms on Eastman Lane. Uh, that'd be Lane. the North Apartments. North Apartments, yes. So um, Olympia Place was described as being like North Apartments. So there may be some um, way that we can, you know, find out how North Apartments is 
is managed. Um, there was conversation during the Olympia Place review about having uh, someone on site 24 hours. Um, that was early on in the in the what work of Archipelago um, on in town, and at that time they didn't have a company that was managing their property, so there may be some need to change how they describe um, what they're doing at Olympia Place if they don't have um, 24 hour live in manager. Um, in the end, uh, I think the planning department and the planning board became comfortable with the idea of an apartment style dormitory in this RF zoning district. It's really a place where, um, you know, it's probably the only place in town where the town, meaning people in town hall, and also many of the residents that I spoke with felt like, okay, this was a place that was originally set up for students, so it makes sense to have students be here. There's often a resistance to having, you know, buildings built purposely for students, and that was a reaction that we had to Aspen Heights when that came along, that um, the Zoning Board of Appeals didn't want it to be just for students. They wanted to be able to offer it to whomever came along. And um, part of it is that um, when you have an open building like that, you're required to have um, affordable units as part of the, um, the building. In this case, we wouldn't be requiring affordable units because we would know that uh, the tenants here actually wouldn't be eligible to have um, a, an affordable unit because students are not considered a an eligible um, class of people who's allowed to have affordable units. Now, of course, a family can have an affordable unit and then also have a student who's a member of the family. But as a general rule, uh, students are not um, are not eligible to rent affordable units. So that's a way that this is different from the average um, residential use that we have in town. Um, so. Yeah, I think this is an ongoing conversation, but in the end, the planning board and planning staff became comfortable with this idea um, when Olympia Place was presented. And we think it's a good model and we think it's been well managed and we haven't, um, we are not aware of a lot of complaints about it. Um, so um, I guess that's what I have to say. Okay, thanks, Chris. Janet. So I, I, you know, I, when I read through all that material about the planning board deliberations and, and, I, you know, it seemed to me that um, the management plan was quite extensive and um, taking care of the students who were going to be there with, with the onsite 24 hour reception, because um, students are going to be coming in late as well as their friends. And I think that's safety issues for people. And then there was going to be a live in superintendent. So if that has changed, then the management plan plan has changed and I'm not sure if they have to come back for that but that's I didn't realize that that, that there was a possibility of change and I, I, I if I don't know it I guess I don't know if anyone else does know that also that leads to an issue which is um, I would be really interested in the experiences of people who live near this project like Olympia Oaks and so which is right down the way and I know that Pathfinders runs that affordable housing community which is actually quite lovely and filled with little kids and bicycles and trees um, and, you know, you know, cookouts and things. And I wondered, um, but notifying pathfinders isn't really notifying the neighbors. So I, I would like to have the planning board, the planning department, reach out to pathfinders and just you know, notify the neighbors that another building is going up and if they have any comments about how things are working, what they would like to see. All right. All right. Thank you, Janet. Um, I see that it's eight o'clock. We customarily take a break at this time. So unless anybody objects, I was thinking we would do that and then come back in another five minutes. Anyone object? No. <laughs> All right, so the time is 8.01 and we'll reconvene at 8.06. Please turn off your camera and, your, and mute your microphone.
Hey, Karen, just want to say hi. I haven't like been uh, on a call for like formal introduction yet, but anyhow, I know that'll happen again, but just hello. I apologize to Karin for not introducing you to everybody in the beginning of the meeting. I kind of feel comfortable with you now and I feel like everybody knows you, but that's not true. <laughs> so maybe Doug would like to make a formal introduction when he comes back. And sorry for the mispronunciation, Karin. Okay, 807. Doug, um, a topic arose while you were gone, which okay. is that we never formal, formally introduced Karin to the rest of the board. Um, and so I wondered if you would like to do that now. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Uh, I, I think I should just say we welcome Karen, Karen Winter to the, to the board. This is her first meeting with us. Um, Karen, do, do you want to elaborate on your background or your why you wanted to sit with us on this board? Uh, anything you'd like us to know about you while we get to know you? Um, yeah, thank you for taking time to, to introduce me. I really look forward to working with this group. During COVID, I started to watch planning board meetings and other meetings and being part of the local historical uh, society. I was just so impressed with the caliber of the people that work in the Amherst government, both the staff and the and the volunteers. I always how how carefully you weighed uh, everything, how how thoughtfully you listened to the the people that from the public who chimed in. And uh, I just wanted to be a part of it. I also I think through my experience living in Europe and being related to people who develop all kinds of magnificent, wonderful uh, places in Berlin, I thought that maybe I could offer a kind of a unique um, sort of something that, that comes from far away, uh, maybe a different way of looking at things. I realize many of you travel and have this too, but uh, I just wanted to be a part of it. So thank you for introducing me. And I look forward to working with you. Okay, thank you, Karen. Okay, um, we were so we were discussing Kyle's project. Um, Janet, you have some additional questions that have come up. Well, I just wanted to sort of give a explain a little bit what I was talking about, other than the legal issue, which of course you know is super important. Um, so I did some reconnaissance. Like my son has been over to Olympia Place. He is a friend from Amherst High there. Uh, I talked to him, the friend. Um, it's a, you know, you go inside, it's beautiful. It seems very well cared for. There's a lot of public space. You're expanding in this building. I'm not anti the building, but I want to, I'm very pro zoning and pro zoning bylaw requirements and making sure they're interpreted correctly. To me, Olympia Place seems to be very functioning. The, the former tenant said it was kind of a quiet building, partly because there's a lot of international students. Um, and, you know, and then the, you know, the, and it was just kind of a quiet place. And, but he could have friends over, he could have parties, kids could play pool and stuff like that. And so it seems to me, this is a very functioning building. And so when I was looking at the management plan for it, I was like, well, that's the special sauce. Let's look at that and apply it next door and make sure we continue that. I'm beginning to wonder though, about you know what projects we have in Amherst and when we require on site site management 24 hour. I sort of remember when Kendrick Place was going in that they wanted to have a receptionist 24 hours. And so I would love to get a list of those, you know, different management plans and requirements in different parts of town. I know in Barry Roberts' most recent Fearing Street, which is just 24 units, he was planning to have on-site live-in management. And so 
uh, I just think we need to, um, I just think it's an important issue. And, you know, if one place is working really well, why not do it next door? And if we're not going to do it next door, how does that not just turn into an apartment building for students? Um, so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any hands, so I will ask a couple of questions that I had. Uh, Kyle, the first one was, I wondered if you could go into further detail about the uh, the stormwater management. Um, you know, I didn't notice where you had a, you know, a reservoir you were going to collect runoff and obviously having the conservation land at the bottom of the hill. Uh, we want to be sure we don't damage uh, the town conservation land. And Car and I do see your hand. Uh, I, I, I think I'll wait till Kyle has addressed the stormwater. Do you want me to share the screen and show the symbol? Yeah, if you don't mind. No problem. Can you see that? Yeah. So this is sheet four of six on the Sybil, and it shows our uh, the stormwater uh, structures. So you can see that in the courtyard, uh, we're making the grades work. Uh, we end up with piping. So we have low points, one, two, three, four, five, that, that come out to the street. And there is a structure that is out towards the street. Um, and then you'll see in the back, uh, we're catching roof drainage and putting in cultex that are out at, towards the bottom of that, uh, the steps and future ramp uh, that collect it on the uh, west, uh, the east side of the property. So on the east side, we've got Coltec. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, 12 of those uh, stacked together that we would grade over. Uh, we have another five uh, down here. And then uh, the low points on uh, in the courtyard go right out to the, uh, the storm sewer. And then we are able to keep the off the flow off site below existing uh, at or below existing conditions. So in terms of structure, uh, the majority of those are on the uh, east side as you look out towards conservation. And could you tell me what a coal tech is and what happens yep. to the water after it's all collected in there? Uh, the coal tech uh, retains it. It's, uh, they call it retain it. Uh, it flows in and it drops and so it slows. And so the event of a hundred year storm, it takes a while for that to uh, flow out or go off site. So it slows, uh, it slows anything in the event of a large storm. And you can see the arrays up on the top of the screen. And where does the water go from the coal tech? Is it discharged into ground and it's percolated in, or is it piped up There's, to the stormwater? So the portion of the stormwater that goes to the east and goes into the retain it uh, coal tex, then goes out to a level spreader that is on the northeast part of the site. Okay. And so anything that comes out hits gravel and gets dispersed uh, on the site. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. All right. Um, and then the other question I had was about the leasing arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, Chris had noted that you, it looked like you were leasing by the bedroom rather than by the unit. And I wondered if you could confirm that and just talk about if you've done that in other buildings and how that works. Yeah. Uh, at 47 Olympia, we would lease by the bed. Um, and uh, that works quite well. It allows each parent, if all of us are parents and uh, two, three, or four of our children live in one unit together, uh, that they, uh, the liability for each of us as a guarantor of our student is limited to our student and not the entirety of uh, the lease. Okay. So uh, a better situation for tenant and guarantor. And have you had situations where there was uh, irreconcilable conflict between people in the same unit? Uh, and how and how did you deal with it? Uh, I would defer to Alex on that. I, th absolutely, there have been you know some uh, property management is a high is a requires a lot of engagement. So uh, I would say that Alex has been able to manage that very well. Okay. Haven't had any problems arise from that uh, that I know of. All right, Chris, I see your hand. Do you want to comment on any of what's come before? 
I wanted to comment on the stormwater um, design and to note that I spoke with um, Erin Jacques, who's the wetlands administrator. She's the staff liaison for the Conservation Commission, and she noted that there was no information about um, soil test pits having been dug in the locations where these retain it structures are to go. So if you have that information, that would be um, useful information to give us and also to give the Conservation Commission when you go before them. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, Karen, you're on. And you are already unmuted. Oh, I'm already unmuted. Okay. Uh, Bruce brought this up a little bit. Um, so with my European background, I'm honing in on encouraging bicycle use. This seems like the perfect building, the proper uh, distance from UMass to really uh, think about how you're going to encourage uh, students to bring their bicycles and to have their bicycles, if possible, in a covered safe place. I know my kids who have really good bicycles want them someplace where they're safe. And I know if this building were a dormitory in Europe someplace, they would have, uh, they, they definitely would have some sort of a locked space where people could safely access their bicycles. We want to encourage bicycle paths. We want to encourage people to get away from the idea that everybody has a car. So I, I'm sure you've thought about this, but I would encourage you to really look at the space and see if there's anywhere where you could really maybe fit in a, a storage place for bicycles uh, so that students feel safe bringing them and keeping them there. That was one point that I had the other pretty a naive question uh looking at this building are these windows that that open up so i mean i'm hoping i'm assuming they are yes they are they are okay Case, casement so they open yeah that's wonderful okay that's great so those were just my two little comments and i do second um or, or i want to also what janet mcgowan is saying about the management plan i myself was an ra a graduate student in an undergraduate dorm. I know how many things uh, happen in undergraduate dorms that happen quickly where it's really important that somebody be there to address that. So uh, I am concerned about just a property management that deals with uh, lots and lots of properties that can be called because there, there, there are so many things that, that come up in the life of an undergraduate dorm. Okay, that's all, thanks. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. I have a very quick question. I think in the, um, two questions actually, um, the, you didn't show, like you showed the different um, layouts, but there were, I assume there's kitchens in those, right? Um, yes. It's, Okay, so it's not front end. The other question I have was about rents. Like, what is the one bedroom going to be? What's the two bedroom? What's the three bedroom? Uh, good. We haven't set rents yet for any of the units. We usually do that about a year before it opens. Any other questions, Janet? No. Okay. Um, I don't see any any other hands on the board? Maybe at this time we'll see if there are any public comments from attendees. So I see Pam Rooney's hand. Let's bring her back over into the panel. All right, Pam, where you are here, you should be able to unmute. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for letting me in. Um, have a couple questions. Um, I wonder if it would be possible, and I'm, I would I would ask the board, since I can't ask for things to happen, I would ask the board if you could ask the applicant to provide a cross section of this building to show the height of the wall between the Mather building and this site. It appears to be roughly 10, 10 feet in height, which is kind of a really uh, awkward height. Uh, ch change of elevation from the UMass property down to the entrance or the lower uh, the south side of this building. Um, 
we you had a conversation about the height of the building. I was also going to talk about that. Uh, when I look at section 6.170, the diagram shows measuring the height of a building to the top of a flat roof, but in fact, it, sh it is indicating to the top of, of whatever is visible on that facade. And I know we have had conversations in the past about uh, the height of uh, parapets and that a parapet is clearly integral to the facade of a building. Therefore, a parapet should be what is measured, not the roof itself. In particular, if we're talking about a parking garage, that's obviously very different than um, um, the parapet height. So it would be, I think it would be wise for the planning department uh, and all those who have to deal with this um, uh, discrepancy to clarify it. Um, on the grading plans of the build of the site plan, it's really difficult to, to figure out what the what the grades are on the surrounding properties, and uh, you know the 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 elevations are very clear on the property itself. But I would encourage, as a developer, you to uh, also include the the grades and elevations surrounding it, so you can actually see what's happening. Therefore, my request to see a cross section. Um, you've had a good conversation about management. I would just note that in, I think almost any apartment building in Amherst, uh, we have we have asked the town has asked for management plans that show either an on-site manager or or clearly the name of someone to call in an emergency. Um, with 230 people in a building, uh, it seems irresponsible to not have some kind of on-site staffing. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, yes, finally, uh, when you are talking about 47 and 57 uh, Mather Drive, not Olympia Drive, um, I think it would be very helpful for the board and for anyone looking at these projects to understand how the two projects are linked on the ground. If there is an extension of sidewalk, for instance, or site amenities that link the two parcels together rather than having them two separate blips on a map. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Kyle, anything in there you want to comment on or respond to? Uh, sure. Uh, cross section is no problem. I uh, just wanted to uh, make sure it was clear. There's no the retaining wall is not 10 feet. Uh, we're we're reconciling 365 and 361, 362. So it's about a three foot wall on the south side to Mather. Can I? Am I still on? You are, Pam. Okay. Can I just follow up? And are you going to provide some kind of fencing on the Mather um, uh, office building so that they, you know, that there's protection for them on a four foot wall? Uh, I think we absolutely could. Okay. Um, I guess the only comment I'll make, Pam, is that. Uh, earlier, Chris seemed pretty pretty clear that they measure the height of the building to the top of the roof, and that the parapet is not part of that calculation. I would so, counter. I would counter to say that the diagram on in section six point one seven is not very explicit, given that these are mostly uh, residential type buildings or structures shown. It does not show a modern building with a flat roof with a parapet. And I uh, think, that, and I, 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 okay, and I, I don't uh, actually know how to find the section you're referring to. Well, it's on page 76 of the zoning bylaws. So, um, oh, I, oh, okay, you're not looking at the archipelago package. No, no, I am looking at our bylaws. Okay. And so, I, may I say something? Sure, Chris. So the building commissioner is the zoning enforcement officer. 
And he has determined that the top of the roof is the top is the height, the place where you measure the height to, not the um, parapet wall. He said that several times in several different um, arenas, and so he's the zoning enforcement officer. So that's the that's who we uh, go to. We want a question asked answered. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, any more discussion? Thank you, Pam. And um, I, Kyle, I hope you can provide some of the material that Pam was asking about. Bruce, I see your hand. Um, yes, uh, further to what Christine said and, and what uh, Pam was observing, um, it does seem to me to be um, odd that the height is determined by the roof um, at some point not now it would seem that we should uh, examine the logic of that and whether we might want to uh, consider um, some kind of change or, or, or some kind of explanation that would uh, help us understand why that odd situation why why that uh, uh, roof plane is determined because roof planes aren't even flat you know so i suppose it's the top of the roof plane but uh, it, it seems odd to me. And I just suggest that we might want to spend some time at some point finding out why yeah, uh, it's just, that way. So maybe, Chris, maybe it would be worth having, I mean, I don't know if we should take a lot of time from Rob, but see if he could maybe join us at some future meeting and talk about that. I can kind of see it from both sides. One, one side is, well, you can see the parapet from the street. It looks like the building goes all the way to the parapet. So that's the height of the building. Um, the other thing is that that kind of rule would discourage people from putting parapets on a building so that they can get as much height um, you know, without being penalized. And uh, I think from a, public, from a life safety point of view, you probably want to have a parapet on a building uh, just to keep minimize the likelihood of somebody falling off. And then when you, uh, when you look at the top of a building, you've got all kinds of things that are higher than the roof plane and higher than the roof than the parapet usually. So where do you, you know, what are you going to measure to the highest, the highest thing that's 100 feet back from the street or, you know, where do you, where do you, what do you use? So that seems to be what Rob has concluded is the most consistent thing to do. So let's see if he can elaborate at all. Okay, um, Janet. So in terms of things for next time, I didn't even, I, I had just these, I got a set of diagrams that were like really poorly, um, like it seems like everybody, somebody's really out of toner, but they were kind of small. I'm not even sure I have a landscape plan. Maybe it's L1.0, but, um, so I just couldn't read it at all. And I, I couldn't read the um, legal documents either. I mean, I was trying to kind of filling in the blank of what I thought the word said. And so I would love to get a more detailed landscaping plan with the plantings, um, seeing some evergreen um, screening from other buildings. Um, and then also a, a photometric plan for the lighting. And then um, just a better explanation of the, the, um, the, the parking, situation because I couldn't see any documents that guaranteed parking to this lot. I saw they think these legal instruments were conveying things to UMass that wasn't coming back. So I just I think I need a better roadmap. And if there isn't a way to guarantee parking to the building, I would like to see a condition that requires if the thing with UMass goes south, that there will be some kind of parking and the numbers of that. So but I just I just actually I just need plans that I can read. Yeah, I know at the site visit, we, Kyle, you had mentioned you had a Dropbox uh, that we could maybe get access to to see better resolution images of the drawings. And um, Chris, you were going to send us a link if, if Kyle could provide that. So I think it would be helpful to follow through on that conversation. I can, I can resend on that. Thanks. Chris? I just wanted to ask Pam a question. Pam, are you um, facile with creating Dropbox from our um, from our end? Because we um, have 
we have drawings that Kyle sent us. Um, the mechanism that we use to send them out is to print them and then scan them, which is not a good mechanism, but it's the only one that we have figured out to date. So I wondered, Pam is very smart at technology and she may have the ability to create a Dropbox from what we have. Uh, alternatively, Kyle can send me a Dropbox link and then I can forward it to everybody. Maybe that's the best way to do it. But as we receive more and more things uh, in the future, maybe it would be good if we could figure out how to do the Dropbox. And maybe Pam knows all about that already, but I don't. Well, I think in the immediate thing, Kyle, if you have a Dropbox link, if you want to forward it to me, that would be really helpful. Um, and then we can get it out to the planning board. And in terms of what we receive coming forward, we can work out a plan. Okay. I'll make sure to copy you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Chris, if you're worried that this link really is where the public needs to come um, and that they ought to have access to the link, you know, if you get the Dropbox link from Kyle, you, you know, Pam can download or download those files and then put them right on her Dropbox. And that can be where the public comes. Problem with Dropbox is that it is limited to an amount of time. In my experience, it usually goes away after 30 days or something. So having it be the source of information for the public is challenging. So. Pam and I can talk about it and we can talk with IT and try to figure out a, a way of getting clear images online for the public to see. But the most immediate um, issue is to get clear images for the planning board. So Kyle, if you can help us out with that, we'd appreciate it. Okay, great. Um, Janet, you're back. Um, <laughs> so one of the things... You're muted. One of the things that was mentioned in the development application report as a potential issue was, does UMass, um, I think last year, UMass was asking the town of Amherst for 500 extra parking spaces. And so I wonder, are there, were those, were these lots filled up during the academic year? And is there space for an extra 100 or 200 cars? So is there somebody at UMass who would be on top of that, that could be consulted? Um, were these lots filled to the brim? Um, and then I guess we'll have a live, you know, example in the next month or so too. Chris, is there someone we could ask at UMass? I can do some research and find that out. Okay. Chris, I think Nancy Buffone would be the person to talk to and she pretty much all communications from the university comes through her. Thank you. Okay, uh, the time is 8.34. Um, let's see, I don't see any hands from either board members or panelists. Um, Kyle, I will, uh, I will mention again something I mentioned at our site visit yesterday, and that is I do think it would be worth trying to fit a drop-off on in front of your building, particularly for ADA drop-off, um, and rather than relying on ADA parking spaces across the street to get everyone over to your building, I think I don't I don't know how you dealt with that at 57, um, but I think it would be worth trying to squeeze that in at 47, and then. Um, I, I guess I do also uh, think if you were able to get more clarity about your parking arrangement with UMass, that that would be worthwhile. And I think it would make all of us more comfortable with uh, you know, giving you the waiver on the parking counts. All right. so. Uh, Remind me, Chris, do we need to vote to continue the hearing? You do, yes. Okay, thank and you. I, I would suggest um, September 21st as a date. Um, it's possible that the Conservation Commission could 
hold a public hearing on September 14th if Kyle gets an application in pretty quickly. Um, and then you would know by um, September 21st what the Conservation Commission had to say. Your meeting on um, September 7th is pretty heavy, pretty filled with things so far. So um, anyway, I would, I would recommend the 21st and you could say that it would be at 635 if you wanted to do that. Okay. And by then we should hear from the uh, town engineer and from the um, fire. fire. From fire department, right? Yeah. Okay. I would move to continue this whoa, hearing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Janet, oh, Janet, hold on. With that. Janet, no. Um, Bruce, I see your hand. You are muted, Bruce. Sorry, my screen just went blank. Something happened, but I found it again. Um, it, it, it's just the uh, the matter of the site coverage waiver. It's a very, very small item, but we haven't discussed it at all. And I thought we, we I mean, it seems to me to be uh, almost perfunctory, but I wanted to just uh, put it on the, put it, put it before us to see whether we have any uh, questions or comments on that. I don't, but I, I wonder if others do. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bruce, for bringing that up. Um, do others, uh... Do, does anyone have some concern about it? We're talking about a fraction of a percent, as I recall. All right. Bruce, I think you've got your answer. I don't think there's too much concern about that. Chris, is it likely that the Conservation Commission will be focused on that percentage? No. OK. All right. Um, so, uh, Chris, uh, have we covered what you hoped to cover this evening? I mean, we could start through the development application report. I know there were a number of items you were saying the board may wish to ask about or continue or consider. Um, would it be worth us starting in on that tonight? If you have the energy to do that. Okay. Well, it, may it feels be worth at least acknowledging what those things are. Right. Well, it feels like we have a relatively light agenda this evening, and you've just revealed that we have a heavy agenda at the beginning of September. And uh, who knows what it's going to look like by the middle of September. So uh, I see, you know, Johanna's got her water. She's hydrated and she's ready to go the rest of another hour if we have to. Uh, <laughs> All right, so why don't we turn to that? Um, Chris, I will say the special permit that we are considering at, uh, as written at the beginning of the development application report is actually for this 2023 and it's not for 2014, um, which is probably the template you use to save as or something. Where is that written? That's very important. Second, second line, yeah. page one. Second line of page one. I'm so sorry. Yep. Now you've known. Now you know my secret. <laughs> okay. All right. So as I, I went through and sort of marked where you had suggested uh, things for the board to consider, the first one I found uh, was actually several pages in. Here we go. So under use category on page four, uh, sort of a third of the way down, the board may wish to impose a condition that would prohibit the units becoming condominiums if the property changes ownership in the future. Uh, is, that, is that a danger, Chris, that we ought to be aware of? Uh, have we done that on other projects? You did it on the um, Olympia Place project, and I think that you know someone um, feared that that might happen. And um, the way the other conditions are written, that you know the tenants need to be students who are matriculating at one of the local universities or colleges, um, may or may not preclude 
the building turning into condominiums. So someone was af afraid of that, and that's why we put that condition on there. So uh -huh. there are people who are equally afraid in this group, then it's probably worth putting that condition there. I guess I'm going to have to ask uh, the silly question, what's the problem if it becomes a condominium? Well, then uh, it other, than, other than that, nobody likes condominiums, I guess. It wouldn't be managed in the same way. Condominiums are managed by a condominium association. So, uh -huh. um, Well, it certainly would people. take it farther from being a sort of yeah. dormitory relationship. All right, um, the next one, the board may wish to require a new man management plan uh, if the property changes hands. And that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, Chris, let me know if I forget or miss something, but the next one I saw was at the top of page five under parking issues to consider. Uh, the board may wish to require that the applicant submit information about walking routes and bus routes and information on on-site bicycle parking, both inside and outside. Seems like we touched on that pretty heavily earlier. I think a number of us are interested in bicycles uh, as a, you know, a very practical uh, transportation for the students in this building. Hey Doug, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could you tell me what page you're on in the packet? I'm, I'm trying to. Find uh, it. No, I can't because I'm working from the hard copy. Oh, you have your hard copy. All right, near the front or or. Uh, is there the anyone front? who else? Page fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johanna. All right, so uh, still on page five. The the next one down was. Um, says the UMass parking lots may not be formally engineered with defined pav pavement and parking lines. These parking spaces may not have handicapped parking spaces clearly delineated. And these parking spaces may not be lit for nighttime use. So uh, the board may wish to ask the applicant for information on these matters. Um, that, that all seems reasonable. And Kyle, uh, is that a difficult thing to provide? Uh, we can show the current state of everything that's out there in terms of the lots and the lights and what's been improved since Olympia Open and what's stayed the same. OK. Uh, Chris, as a part of this uh, review by the town, would Rob be involved in seeing where the handicapped spots are in relationship to the building. And I can ask seems, him. I it can seems ask to him. me that, that it, you yeah. know, if, if Kyle can provide the information that he just agreed to, to do, that it would be worth reviewing that with Rob um, just to make sure we're not letting Kyle get into a situation where he's not going to get a building permit once Rob sees it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why. That's why we brought up the issue of um, the drop off, because the last time um, Kyle wasn't providing on site parking and building commissioner said, well, if you don't provide on site parking, then you have to have a drop off. So I think they reached a compromise because they um, archipelago was able to provide handicapped spaces on an adjacent lot. And I don't exactly know how they managed to do that, but that seemed to suffice and not require drop off. And okay. so um, there needs to be a conversation about this and a right. resolution of it. Well, I think especially because the parking is 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 being provided on the on property that's not controlled by the developer, I think it's good for us to have that early. Hmm. All right. Uh, the next item you had, the last item under issues to consider for parking did did have to do with the drop-off area. So mm -hmm. we've covered that. All right, so now we move to modification of dimen dimensional requirements. Uh, I didn't see any issues for us to consider there. We've talked about the height variance. I guess you want clarification from the building commissioner about um, the measurement of the height. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it seems it seems like it seems like it's clear. I think the question was why sort of the justification. Uh, so then on page six under lighting, uh, there were there were several items here. Uh, you know, submission of catalog cuts for all exterior lighting, uh, the requirement that all exterior lights be downcast or shielded and dark sky compliant. I think we would do that as a matter of course. And then um, some questions about discrepancies of the lighting on the lighting plan, uh, uh, questions about the existing lighting from UMass parking lots. Um, the, 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 the next bullet, the street lights that were proposed to have been installed along Mather and Olympia. Chris, what did you mean by that? Were there street lights proposed as part of 57 Olympia that may not be there? May no. never have been installed? I noticed the other day when we did our site visit that there were lights that were um, installed as part of Olympia Drive. Olympia, yeah, 57 Olympia. And um, the question would be, is the applicant proposing to put similar lights um, in front of this new building? And so that would be one item. And we would want to see a picture of those to mm -hmm. be able to approve them. And then um, we, we want to know, there were two large Cobra headlights on Mather Drive that looked like someone else had put them in, perhaps UMass. But those were very... Um, Janet noticed this. That I think they were sodium, high pressure sodium lights. They were really yellow, and you know we don't have any control over what UMass does with their lighting. But that's not um, a look that the planning board generally likes to have. So new lighting should always be um, well. We would hope that it would be LED, and hope that it would be of a color that would not be you know glaringly white, um, more of a warm color, and so. But we don't have any information about these things. So we would like to have that information. OK. And then the last item under the lighting was uh, whether there was any other lighting, such as under benches or wall sconces that um, you know we just hadn't heard about. And they did have bench lighting in their um, Olympia Place project. They had mm -hmm. lighting under the benches. They also had lighting. I think they had lighting around some uh, landscape, raised landscape beds, but I, I'm not exactly sure. But the lighting under the benches, I think, was some kind of strip lighting. Are they going to do that here? So anything about lighting, we would want. We don't have a lot of information about lighting right now. Right. Kyle, do you think by uh, the next meeting that you would be able to have some of that? Yes, all of it. OK, great. All right, the next category was the erosion control plan. And uh, we've, we've touched on the fact that we don't have comments back from the town engineer and the conservation commission on that. Moving on to page seven, uh, traffic, dim, traffic impact statement. Um, I know Janet had commented earlier that, that she would like to see a traffic impact report similar to what was done previously. Um, and then, uh, Chris, uh, will uh, the town engineer be commenting on whether one is required from his point of view? Only if we ask him. Okay. I think it no. would be worth asking. Okay. Uh, other board members, do you disagree with asking for his opinion? Tom? Yeah, I really ask and find out what he thinks. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to topic seven, the drainage and utilities. Um, issues to consider at the bottom. Um, board may wish to receive comment from the town engineer on the stormwater report and drainage, drain, grading and drainage plans prior to approving. So I. I would agree with that and Chris hope we can get those comments before the 21st. And we would say I would add to that that we need comments from the Conservation Commission as well. Yes. 
uh, sewer and water, town systems, signage. Uh, you were suggesting that we require a, a sign plan be reviewed and approved um, as a condition of the site plan review. So that can follow. Yep. All right. Next page. Management plan and proposed lease. Uh, okay, this had to do with whether the leases would be individual or by unit. And um, I think we've got a clear answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can decide what to do with that information. Kyle, is this the only building that you've got that you do that? I'm sorry, I missed the end of that. Yeah, uh, the, question, the question was uh, by, leasing by bedroom. Is this the only building you're doing that with? Uh, we do that at uh, next door at 57 Olympia. Right, okay. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it, just, just that one. Okay, thank you. Um, fire department review, we need that. Town engineer, we need that. Conservation commission, we need that. So that's lot, all of that. Moving over to page nine, landscape plan. May I say something about those three things? Yep. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to get comments from other departments. And so I would, encourage Kyle and Dave to um, to seek out the town engineer and um, the uh, fire department um, inspector and get comments from them. Um, I can encourage them. I can send them emails, you know, all day. And if the applicant asks for that, you know, maybe I'll get it sooner. So thank you. Great. Uh, issues to consider under the landscape uh, may wish to con consider requiring a more complete landscape plan. Um, Kyle, the one, sounded... was, the one that was submitted has a list of plants, but there's no connection between the list and what's shown on the drawing. So we need to know where those plants are going and also how many of them, the quantities were um, blank. So there just needs to be more detail on the landscape plan. And, and um, I think Janet mentioned some plants that she wanted to see added. I believe she mentioned evergreens. So if they can kind of beef up the landscape plan with some evergreens and just make it clearer where the different plants are going. Janet, was there any, a particular area you wanted evergreens? I mean, I guess. I, I thought about a, a buffering the view of, from, of other, um, of the building from other residents, from Olympia Oaks. So either the. The requirement. The south side or the north side. I think it's a bylaw requirement. Right. And okay. I thought that, you know, it looked, it, you know, it's super screened right now, but that's mostly leaf, leafy trees. And so. Otherwise, I think it's kind of, um, for especially for Olympia Oaks, kind of a stark um, view of a very, very tall building in what looks like a small kind of New England village, which is what they have going. So I thought it'd be good to put some plants that would screen that view. Okay. And I guess my only thought on plantings was that you avoid invasive species like burning bushes and, you know, other things that we're generally trying to discourage. Uh, item topic 16, bike racks. Um, uh, sorry. Interrupt? Sure, oh, sorry, Bruce. Uh, you, you missed the uh, architecture. Uh, there, there was a, a issue to consider before landscaping related to the board may wish to require the applicant to submit a plan that shows handrails on the stairs and the garden oh, yeah. and so forth. And actually, uh, um, I, I, this, this is probably a building uh, uh, code thing, but the, the, the uh, item that Pam Rooney mentioned was not a building code thing, I think, and that probably should be enfolded in, in that observation as well. And which of Pam's comments were you thinking of? Oh, the, the idea that maybe there should be a, a guardrail or a fence or some kind of fall protection on the uh, 
on the three to four foot uh, retaining wall on the Mather boundary. Okay. All I right. think that's a requirement, but it would be good to show it on the plans. Yeah. All right, Tom, I see your hand. Yeah, I was just going to note that this would probably be a place where we'd want to see, um, in addition to the handrail, a potential ramp and handrails the like for that as well as part of the architectural updates. Great. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Bruce. Okay, moving farther down the page under sidewalks and site improvements, issues to consider, bikes, bench style, styles are not shown. Um, if they're prefabricated benches, uh, catalog cuts or drawings uh, of the design might be useful. Um, coordination of the site plan with the landscape plan. Um, submission of a coordinated set of drawings. That seems like a reasonable suggestion. Detail of retaining walls. And the last page, number 10, open space. Uh, consider whether the proposed entry space and lawn will provide adequate open space. And the sort of double-edged sword of open space uh, and whether it's going to in invite large gatherings and poor behavior, I guess. Uh, then propane tank, we need a location, location for that and how it's filled. So that's, that's everything that, that Chris noted. Chris, it's always great to have these. You're so thorough. Save, save us all the thinking. <laughs> all right. Um, anybody else have some things they wanted to mention to Kyle before we see him in roughly six weeks? Not seeing any hands. Uh, uh, why don't we do one more opportunity for public comment? And I see we don't have very many members of the public who have stuck with us through this. Not seeing any hands there. Okay. All right. Um, so I guess it's time to continue our hearing. Anybody want to make the motion to continue to uh, September 21st, uh, starting at 6.35 PM? Uh, Johanna. I move to continue with the hearing to September 21st at 6.25 PM. Thank you. 35? 35, 635, 635, 635, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Andrew? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. I'll try it from the uh, end of the alphabet going up. Karen? Uh, aye. OK, thank you. And Johanna? Aye. Janet. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Tom. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an I. It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Kyle. It looks like thank you. A fun project. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time. Good night. Bye, Kyle. Good night. Okay, it's eight fifty nine. And we'll move on to the next item in the agenda. So we're up to item five, old business. Chris, do we have any old business not reasonably anticipated? I don't believe so. All right. Uh, item six is new business not reasonably anticipated. I do not have any new business. Item seven, Form A, a &R subdivision applications. We do not have any a &Rs today. And number eight, upcoming ZBA applications. We do have two. 
Let me just bring up some slides that will help me to describe it. It's actually two of them. All right, can you see the uh, screen okay? The ZBA is next going to meet on August 25th. They're going to take up a project at 1147 North Pleasant Street, where there is already, so this is the lot right here, there is already an existing two family, and they are proposing to add a single family residence here, which would be owner occupied. Um, so it would be a detached single family owner occupied. So here we go, here's a little map. This is what is existing. This is a two family dwelling. And they're proposing to build this single family residence here with a garage and it will be owner occupied. Um, so you enter the lot via this right here where there is already existing parking. So this is all pavement here. So they're gonna add a little bit more. Um, yeah, and that's their proposal. So the question is, is if you think you might like to see a presentation on this. All right, Andrew. I was just curious, is this, is this an ADU or this is like a, a, a full on um, new, house it's a brand new residence um and so what it would be it would be a complementary principal use to this existing two family that's here so it's just a single this is a duplex it's two units and they're going to build this single family home which will be owner occupied and how large is the lot that's a really good question. I don't think I have the answer to that, Andrew. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, I do not have the exact answer to that. So if we look on here, we ought to be able to figure it out, right? Well, it looks like it's about... Just double checking. I don't want to make sure until the lights off by accident. Okay, thank you. You can stay all day. Okay. Oh, uh, Chris, are you, can you mute? I'm sorry. Um, so it looks like the lot's maybe 75 feet wide and plus 10, maybe 85 feet wide and about 200 feet deep. So. I think closer to 300. Uh, is that right? 80, 89, oh, 41 yeah. and 215. Okay. So, yeah. So I think an acre is 200 by 200, roughly. And so this is probably about an acre. If it's about 300 by 85, 89, it's probably just short of an acre. Um, anyway, so that's, that's one you can think about. And then the next one that they're also going to hear on August 25th, this is the Hickory Ridge Golf Course, which um, they have a permit to do some solar out there. And they need to, they're just coming before the ZBA. They need to modify a condition um, in order. So their condition number 23 says that pesticides are not allowed to be used. Um, and the Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, they have put forth their conservation management permit for um, plantings, which actually include, there's three things that it includes, and, um, hand pulling and pesticides, and there's another one. But anyway, they want to um, modify condition number 23 to include the use of pesticides if needed so that it's consistent with what the Massachusetts um, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife has put forth. They're also asking to extend the expiration date um, of their permitting, which currently is September 12, 2022. Um, but as we all know that the industry around construction um, is definitely facing some hardships. 
Um, so with that in mind, they are hoping to push back this, the start date of anything that's significant to September 12, 2023, so by one year. And that's right. what I know. Chris has her hand raised. Yes, Chris, I see your hand. I just wanted to note that the reason that they want to use pesticides is to eliminate um, some plants that they don't want to be there so that they can add the correct type of plants. So it's really just a short term use of pesticides to re remove plants that they don't think should be there and add the correct plants um, in alignment with um, the Massachusetts regulations. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, where where are we? Where are we? I, I can't figure out from this little excerpt. Is that the Fort River in the middle there? And what, what street are we on? This is West the Hickory Pomeroy River. Land. Yeah. Sorry. So Sorry. along the along the bottom of this parcel is West Pomeroy Lane. In, in the lower right corner is that intersection of 116 and Pomeroy. Pomeroy. So this is, the golf, this is the golf course, right? Yes. Right. Yes, it's the okay. Thank you. Okay, now I understand. All right. Um, so how do folks feel about these two projects? Um, I guess I'll say personally, I'm not very interested in this one for Pomeroy Lane. Um, I, I have some interest in the other one, just in terms of understanding the process uh, by which someone might propose to build a third unit in the residential uh, zone. But I mean, we don't have to talk about that anytime soon, but it might be interesting to hear that. Uh, and that, But Chris could tell us that without having anybody from ZBA involved. Uh, Andrew. I, I had a similar thought, Doug, uh, just given how much effort and time we put into ADU and knowing that we wanted to try to free up housing um, for, for people to add housing. I think that, that I would I would be interested in hearing about that one. OK, Bruce. I share both your curiosity. OK, all right. Um, uh, Chris, I guess the question is, you know, when would it make sense to do this? Do we have time in our next meeting to discuss this? You do have time at your next meeting. Um, the next meeting is August 17th, and you have so far downtown design standards. Nate is coming back with that. And then I'm trying to get um, Jonathan Gerfine to come and talk to you about some concrete blocks that he's installed at his property at 555 University, uh, not University Drive, uh, Belchertown Road, 555 Belchertown Road. So other than that, you don't have anything okay. on your agenda. So you could accommodate this um, discussion of the 1147 um, North Pleasant mm -hmm. Street at Great. that time. And then you'd be able to make a recommendation for the ZBA's meeting upcoming on the 25th. Okay. And I, I and I guess I'll sort of say that I don't know how 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 we would get that presentation, whether you would make it or somebody from zoning staff or or the applicant. But mm -hmm. I think I'll I'll be interested to hear maybe from you to sort of walk me through the code, the, the zoning code on how are they able to even make this proposal. Do you want me to talk about that now? Sure, it's only 10 after nine. <laughs> so um, there have been other cases of the zoning board allowing a two unit building to be added to a parcel that has a single family house under a special permit. And it comes under that section that Pam referenced um, which has to do with complementary principal uses. So the Zoning Board of Appeals needs to make a finding that the two uses are complementary to one another. Hmm. Um, and then also um, approve the new use. So they did it once on, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was North Prospect Street at the corner 
of North Prospect and Halleck. Um, there's a little um, property that's tucked in there where they added a duplex to a property that already had a single family house. And um, that was approved. And there may be other instances of this. This is kind of the reverse of adding a single family home to a property that already has a duplex. So my impression is that the building commissioner is kind of saying, well, he doesn't see anything in the zoning bylaw that absolutely forbids this. And so he's bringing it forward to the Zoning Board of Appeals to see what they think. And they may say this is a good idea. It's infill and they approve it and they may find reasons not to approve it. So it's this it's a discretionary permit. Um, so it's it's a kind of mm, I won't say. Mm, I guess I could say it's a little bit of a gray area in the zoning bylaw. So, so we agonized over ADUs to allow people in the general residential area to add one unit. <laughs> and I don't know, I guess I didn't realize it was already sort of precedent that you were allowed to add two units. Only with a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, which, as I said, is a discretionary permit. So the okay. ADUs are allowed to be added by um, administrative approval, essentially. By the and is, the, is, is a principal use, is that a clearly defined term or is that sort of gray? I don't think the principal uses are gray. I think they're the uses that are listed in the use category chart. Um, so all of those uses, I don't know how many there are, but there are many different um, residential uses, including single family. There are three different kinds of two family houses. There's townhouse, there's mixed use buildings, there's apartments. I think that's it. But um, mm -hmm. those are all principal uses. And um, I think there's even a, a case of townhouses having been added to a property that already has a house on it on High Street, um, if I'm not mistaken. So again, these are special permits that are brought to the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Board of Appeals holds a public hearing and hears from you know, the neighbors and deliberates and then decides, are they going to grant this permit or not? And in this case, as I said, there's apparently nothing that says you absolutely can't do this. So the building commissioner is saying, okay, zoning board, let's talk about it and you decide. Okay. And so there's precedent for one family adding a duplex. Now we've got a two family adding a single. What's to keep somebody from saying, well, I've got, you know, I've got a single family. I wanna add a triplex or a quad why, why are we limited in this conversation to, to, to two families? We may not be limited, but we are, we are limited by um, dimensional requirements. So you have to have the amount of lot area that you need. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently they do have that. I haven't looked at this carefully, but I would assume that they have the amount of lot area and that they meet all the other dimensional requirements. Okay. All right, great. So we got a lot of hands up here on this one. Johanna. Thanks, my hand is actually up about the other one. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I was just, I was curious whether the state permit has already been granted and whether it's now just a matter of bringing the local permit into alignment with the state permit or whether that state permit is still pending as well. I don't think Pam or I know enough about this to be able to say but maybe Pam does, but I don't. Um, I would say that it has been issued. I would say that that's exhibit A of um, where I got my information from. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Um, no, because there's a permit number, Johanna. Okay. Do you want the permit number? I'm happy to read it to you. Oh, sure. Okay, ready? So it's yep. permit number 19-340-DFW. 
NHESP, and the file number is 18 37988. Thanks. You're welcome. Johanna, so, does that mean you might want us to discuss it or do you want to just look into it on your own? I'm not going to be here on the 17th. So if anybody else is excited to hear this, by all means, put it on the agenda, but I'm not going to push for it. Okay. Well, I haven't heard anyone else particularly advocating for it. So I think we will probably not. Uh, Janet. Um, I think we should hear a presentation on this at our next meeting because, um, you know, it seems to me that with this section 3.01 and other parts of the bylaw, it shows that there can be a lot more density in res residential neighborhoods that many of us are aware of. And there's no particular requirement of owner occupancy either that I see. And so I'd be interested in hearing a presentation about this and what has, has the ZBA required an owner occupant? In one you're, of you're referring to the 1147 North Pleasant yeah. Street. Not yeah. to... I think I think we need to see that presentation and mull think through it and understand how right. even in RN, you know, I think at some point the only thing that limits is the dimensional requirements, which is why, you know, those are important for owner occupancy, I don't think is required. So I, right. I think we'd like to see a presentation on this so we can sort of get our wrap our heads around what's possible. Okay, so you're the fourth member to say they are in support of getting a presentation on this. I think we've now got a quorum, <laughs> and uh, I don't think we need to go through a vote, Chris, unless you particularly want us to. No, you don't need to go through a vote. I'm noting, though, that um, there's a discrepancy in where this is located, if it's located in the neighborhood residence or in RVC, um, because this the paragraph notes rbc yeah, yeah. and the mm -hmm. title oh, notes yeah. RN. rn and then the map and parcel numbers are different so um anyway it, it's All not right. going to make a difference as to whether you want to see this presentation but it will be of note as to whether this is in the rn district or whether it's in rbc right okay Johanna, you still have your hand up? Are you, is that a legacy? It's this. Okay, thank you. Oh, it is in RN, okay. Yeah, it's in the RN. All right, so I'll be in touch with them. Great. All right, uh, so I think that concludes the upcoming ZBA applications. Uh, time is 9.18. And the next item was upcoming special permits, site plan reviews, and uh, subdivision applications. Pam, do we have any of those? Or Chris? Um, no, not off the top of my head, right, Chris? Um, it appears that there is one that's coming in for 51 Spalding Street. And it's another one that is complicated. Um, it's a property that was permitted as a, an owner-occupied two-family on Spalding Street with a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And now the owner wants to make some changes. And I am not entirely clear on what the changes are, but I also know that they, um, they have lodgers there as well as having an owner-occupied two-family. So they're going to be coming before the planning board um, perhaps on September 7th to talk about that project. So that will be a planning board special permit. Okay. And then there are always things out there in the wings and I'll bring them to you as they come along. Okay. Great. All right, uh, the next item is planning board committee and liaison report. Um, Chris, I know you sent a bunch of information on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, I can't remember, were we going to discuss that tonight or when we had elections at the beginning of September? I sent you the information so you could see it 
and um, be able to mull it over. But your actual discussion of elections and um, reorganization is going to be September 7th. So if anyone wants to say anything about it now, I guess you could say that, say what you want to say, but we've got the information and you'll be deciding on September 7th. Okay, Bruce. At my orientation with the staff, uh, Chris, you particularly asked me whether I would be prepared uh, to put myself forward to uh, be a, the board's representative to the commission. And uh, I think I'd be prepared to do that. Um, so that's just to announce that uh, I, I will offer uh, to take the job uh, and happily uh, defer to anybody else who has a a stronger desire. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Let the campaign begin. All right, uh, so we don't have anyone to report on Pioneer Valley Planning Commission this evening. Uh, Andrew, anything on CPAC? Nothing on CPAC. All right, Tom on DRB? Nothing to report. All right. Janet, solar bylaw. We, we met last week and we're doing good work. Um, we discussed recent Supreme Judicial Court cases and land court cases on how to regulate um, solar, how communities can regulate solar facilities. Um, the town is issuing an RFP for a consultant for a solar assessment, which will include um, public outreach about um, what the community wants. Uh, we looked at the model PV Pioneer Valley Planning Commission bylaw, which is excellent. Um, and then we also, we had a great presentation, um, and I can't remember his name, Chris, somebody from um, the town, and we did an overview of, of the town's and state GIS mapping um, resources, which are extensive. And so, you know, in terms of looking at like, where are prom soils, you know, just every possible question, it seemed there's an overlay or a map either on the state, um, the state has it or the town has it. And so, you know, you can look at zoning districts and all sorts of things. I thought that was really excellent. And we might want to look at, get, have, have a presentation to us. Um, and then we're working on a work plan and that's it. All right. We get a lot done in two hours. <laughs> and you're typically meeting during the day, right? Yeah, and that that came up because um, we just we, we were meeting like pretty much 12 to 2 and um, obviously that, you know, we're, we haven't picked a particular day, but people mentioned that it's really hard for people to come at night, you know, if the meetings are at night, people are working during the day, the public can't really attend. So we okay. have to think about. All right. Thank you. And Chris, anything uh, from CRC? I think that the last meeting was not held, if I'm remem remembering correctly. And when is the next meeting? The next meeting is um, the 11th of August. And I think they're going to continue to talk about rental registration bylaw. So if anyone's interested, it's um, 2.30 in the afternoon on Thursday, the 11th. OK. Thank you. Uh, report of chair, I really do not have any report this evening. Report of staff, Chris, Pam. I just wanted to say that I'm very happy that we have two new members. <laughs> and, um, all right. well, Aren't we all? Yep. All right. Uh, so the time is 924. And unless anybody has anything else, we can adjourn. Perfect. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you in roughly two weeks. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Pam. The recording. Good night, Mr. Marshall. We'll see you soon. Yep. <laughs>